Well, good morning, and I'd like to uh, thank, first of all, the graduate students for the opportunity to speak here. So uh, this morning, the, the talk that I'll be giving is really the representation of the work of, of over 25 independent investigators uh, located on four continents uh, across the world. And what the BioCassava Plus program was uh, one of the initial uh, programs funded through the Grand Challenges and Global Health Program. Uh, that was a program of 44 independent uh, programs or projects, largely focused on health-related issues, including control of malaria and HIV/AIDS, uh, vaccine technologies, etc. But one section of the Grand Challenges program, called Grand Challenge Nine. Uh, focused on trying to achieve in a single staple crop complete nutritional um, uh, biofortification so that people subsisting on uh, staple crops in developing countries could receive the full complement of vitamins and minerals and protein that were necessary in their diet. So it was a, a big challenge and um, sort of to put this uh, on, let's see. So to put this in perspective, uh, when we, we speak of the issue of, of uh, malnutrition, it really can be divided up into two uh, primary areas. And the first area is actually getting sufficient calories in the diet. And really that's the driver for uh, the choice that many uh, persons make in the types of foods and the crops they're growing. Can it, first of all, provide sufficient calories to support life? The secondary consideration, which is uh, often more difficult to recognize, particularly for subsistence farmers, is can you actually get sufficient nutrients that are essential for life uh, from your staple crop in your diet? Now, looking at this particular map, what's evident here is, is that uh, the issue of undernourishment or insufficient calories in the diet is really most severe in sub-Saharan Africa. And it was for that reason that uh, we were initially interested in applying uh, to the Grand Challenges program to focus in particular on cassava. And I'll point out in a moment why cassava is so important in sub-Saharan Africa. But in addition to calories, as I pointed out a moment ago, uh, nutrients that are essential for human nutrition are also critically important uh, for um, the development and health, uh, particularly of children under the age of five. And so it's been estimated by the World Health Organization that about a third of the uh, global population is actually partially uh, impaired by insufficient vitamin and uh, minerals in their diet. So annually about five million children uh, across the globe under the age of five are dying prematurely, largely due to disease. But a half, about half of those 5 million children who are dying due to disease are compromised in their immune uh, systems because they're, they have insufficient vitamins and uh, minerals in their diet. But more directly, it's been estimated that about a million children are dying um, uh, due to acute vitamin and mineral deficiency uh, each year uh, across the world. So one of the ways of trying to standardize uh, the impact of various uh, mineral and vitamin uh, nutritional deficiencies as well as diseases uh, on uh, human populations is a term called disability adjusted life years. And this is a term that um, agricultural economists and um, persons involved in world health uh, issues have developed. And it's really the sum of the impact of some deficiency or disease on deaths, uh, years uh, reduced in lifespan, and years lost to disability. And the numbers that you see here are actually to be multiplied by 1,000. So if we look at vitamin A deficiency across the world, you see that there are nearly 21 million, there are at least 21 million disability-adjusted life years that are lost due to vitamin A uh, deficiency. Iron deficiency, which uh, we're perhaps more familiar with in, in the US, is a much smaller impact. But surprisingly, and, and I think a lot of people don't actually appreciate that, uh, 
zinc deficiency is actually a bigger problem than is vitamin A deficiency. And that's largely due to the fact that when children are diseased or if they have diarrhea, they're losing zinc so fast that they actually can't replace it uh, fast enough in their diets and they go zinc deficient very, very rapidly. But there's another important uh, point I want to make here. And if you look at the relative contribution or uh, occurrence of these deficiencies across the globe, it's really in sub-Saharan Africa where the greatest impact on disability adjusted life years is occurring. And um, if we look more specifically at deaths attributed to these deficiencies, again, uh, particularly for vitamin A and zinc deficiency, it's sub-Saharan Africa that's uh, impacted to the greatest degree across the world. So if we take this apart and try to attribute why certain populations are more susceptible to uh, vitamin and mineral nutrition de deficiencies, it really comes down to the agricultural systems that they're employing. So in these developing countries, uh, many farmers are actually what we would call subsistence farmers. So they're providing all of the food for the family uh, on the property that they're uh, cultivating. And so there's, as you can see here, there's a heavy reliance on manual labor. There is no mechanized labor in these uh, subsistence farmers. And they, don't, they virtually have no inputs to improve their agricultural productivity. Um, the, small, the farms tend to be small. And very important is a lack of stability. If there is a crisis in food production, and that can be biotic or abiotic or cultural or political, political unfortunately is often a major issue here, then the, uh, the food production can actually totally collapse. And under those conditions, of course, the families are, are in a crisis situation. Uh, one of our colleagues who is a pediatrician in the uh, BioCassava Plus program uh, works extensively in Malawi. And he tells me that at the time, at the end of the year, just before they're about to harvest the next crop on an annual basis, it's at that time of year where most families are really in, in critical need of, of extra food because they've consumed virtually all of their reserves. So the response, of course, from international aid agencies is to bring in uh, uh, food aid, um, which is OK as a short-term uh, process to address these issues. But as a long-term solution, it has major issues. And the really important concern is, is that it disrupts food prices locally. If you can get food for free from an aid or organization, there's less um, impetus or initiative to actually grow out and grow your own food uh, to generate income. So it disrupts local uh, price structures and farmer incomes dramatically. OK, so what do we uh, propose to do to address this, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa? So in sub-Saharan Africa, if you look at the total production and energy consumed from a variety of crops that are shown here, uh, the first point that I think is important and was in part why we were funded by the Gates Foundation is that cassava is a very, very important crop in sub-Saharan Africa. Number one in terms of the productivity uh, across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and in terms of calories consumed per person, it actually ranks number two below maize. And that's largely attributed to the fact that, uh, that the metric tonnage that you see here is actually on a fresh weight basis. And cassava is about 60% water, unlike corn, of course, which has very little water. So the number of calories for cassava actually ranks number two here. But the other point I want to make here is the protein to energy ratio. Uh, in other words, the amount of protein per unit calorie that's achieved from a cassava-based diet. And this number here is actually the lowest of all the world's major crops. So it's very, very poor in protein. And as I'll point out in a moment, cassava is also very poor in another uh, a number of other uh, required uh, elements in the diet, minerals and vitamins in particular. Now, one of the, the questions that I often get asked is, well, uh, to address issues of malnutrition, why not diversify the diet? And certainly, I, that's a very appropriate and very low-tech uh, approach to addressing malnutrition. 
But the challenge often is, is that other foods, fruits, for example, and, and vegetables in the diet are very are present in very very low amounts, and uh, their contribution to the diet can be limited. Um, and part you might say that's due to the fact that most people are depending on a source of calories primarily uh, for their nutrition rather than diet diversifi diversification. Okay, so let me introduce you to cassava if you're not familiar with it. Uh, cassava is a crop that was, that the genus is uh, native to the Yucatan Peninsula and uh, it was first domesticated in Brazil near the Paraguay border and that's uh, been very well documented to date. So it got to Africa in about the 1500s as the Portuguese from Brazil brought it across uh, the Atlantic Ocean to Africa and there it was very, very successful. So the plant uh, is really a shrub. It'll grow at about two to three meters in height. Um, it has, it's a euphorb, so it produces a lot of latex. There's actually a member of the genus that at one time was used for rubber production, uh, particularly during uh, World War II when rubber tree was uh, restricted. Rubber tree is also a euphorb, so it's a close relative to rubber tree. Um, here is a subsistence farm um, in Africa, and these really lousy looking plants are cassava. Um, so here we have a very healthy looking cassava, probably grown in South America, maybe Colombia or Sia. But here in Africa, you see with very little inputs and no control of insects, uh, it can look pretty poor. Uh, there are two other points I want to make about cassava that are particularly important in terms of our strategy for biofortification. And one of those is, is really represented here. These are stem cuttings uh, from uh, the shrub. They're about uh, 30 centimeters in length or so. And it's these, this material that is actually used to propagate cassava. So many varieties actually don't flower. And seeds are very rarely used uh, by subsistence farmers for propagation. It's virtually all clonal propagation. So clonal propagation is a, is, is a critical element in terms of our strategies for trying to address biofortification of cassava. And that is because if we can genetically engineer cassava to enhance its nutritional qualities, it's a one-time event. So we're not engaged in introgression of traits through multiple generations of uh, breeding of cassava to amplify or to stabilize those traits. It's a one-time event. So that means it's fast. We can actually produce a, a, a product potentially within two years that can go into trials uh, rather than 10 years or more if we use a traditional breeding approach. Of course, there are liabilities with that as well. And um, uh, I'll come back to that later on in the talk. So that's the way it's propagated. This, of course, is the root. And this is anatomically and morphologically actually a true root. It's not a stem or a tuber. And uh, it's about 30% uh, starch by content. Uh, they get to the size that you see here is about 40 to 50 centimeters in length and about 10 centimeters in diameter to give you some idea of the size. But they can actually get quite large. Um, when they're cultivated under ideal conditions. So it's a great source of energy uh, for the diet, but a very poor source of nutrients. So I already mentioned that it has very low levels of, of protein. And actually, if we take 500 grams dry weight of cassava as an adult size meal, not a child's meal, but adult, it can provide 80% of the calories that's required in the diet but only 30% of the protein, and you can see substantially lower amounts of these uh, vitamins and minerals that are indicated here. So when we started the project, we did a survey of the literature on the nutritional qualities of cassava, and these were the uh, nutritional elements that were actually limiting in abundance in the human diet. Um, so we set a very, very high objective, um, if I stay here for a moment on this slide, of trying to actually achieve 100% of the minimum daily requirement uh, in a 500 gram meal. Now again, that's a meal for an adult. For a child, it's substantially less than that. And so um, 
and of course children would have a lower uh, total quantity requirement of these vitamins and minerals. Okay, now nutritional qualities, uh, if I go back to this slide, the only one that, that might actually be evident to a consumer is vitamin A. And the reason for that is our strategy was to overexpress beta carotene or pro-vitamin A. And of course pro-vitamin A is cleaved to form retinol, which is, is the actual vitamin A molecule. But beta carotene we're all familiar with is the orange color of carrot. So it'd be very easy to identify uh, beta carotene uh, biofortified cassava, but the rest of these traits, the vitamin E, iron, zinc, and protein, these are essentially invisible uh, to the consumer and particularly the subsistence farmer. So we did have a marker in a sense potentially for biofortified cassava, but we really felt that if we were going to encourage adoptance and acceptance of these crops, and particularly since they're GMO crops, and again that's an issue I'll come back to in a moment, we needed additional drivers for adoption and acceptance. And so, uh, in addition to hitting these targets that were required by the Gates Foundation for the Grand Challenges Program, we added three other traits that we were focusing on. One was cyanogenic glycosides. And so, cassava roots contain cyanogenic glycosides. There's a range of cyanogenic glycosides in different varieties of cassava ranging from what's called sweet or low toxicity to bitter or high toxicity. And the more toxic varieties of eaten fresh are actually lethal. Um, what you see here are children uh, around uh, Lake Victoria in a village, I believe this is uh, Kenya, uh, who have come down with a disease known as Konzo. And Konzo is an immediate and permanent paralysis uh, associated with eating poorly processed cassava that's high in cyanogenic glycosides. So there, there's a range of neurological disorders associated with cyanide toxicity. Uh, the lowest level chronic exposure results in a disease called ataxic neuropathy, which is similar to Parkinson's. Uh, higher acute uh, poisoning results in Konzo, and then uh, there's death. Now, just to give you an example of the magnitude of this problem, it's been estimated that on the order of about 10,000 children a year across Africa are impacted by cyanogens from cassava resulting in, in conzo, or permanent paralysis of the legs. And that's pretty much the end of their potential for uh, generating income. So it's an important issue. Um, the other issue that we focused on is cassava mosaic virus. Now, in addition to CMV, there are some other viruses that have moved rapidly across to Africa in the last 15 years that are also challenges. Uh, but at the time we started the program, CMV was the most important viral disease uh, in Africa. And as you can see, it substantially reduces productivity, 30 to 50 percent. So. Uh, if you have a low cyanide variety, a variety that is resistant to viruses, and then finally a variety that has a long shelf life, these are all traits that in our surveys the farmers would prefer and could be drivers for adoption and acceptance of these biofortified cassavas. Okay, so I pointed out that cassava has some issues. Um, you know, one issue that I think would challenge all of us in this room is that it has cyanogenic glycosides and potentially toxic levels of cyanogenic glycosides. So let me ask you, how many of you have actually uh, ever eaten cassava? Raise your hand, okay, or yuca, as it's known in South America, or mangioca. How about tapioca? How many of you eat? Pretty much everybody usually has had tapioca. So that's the starch from cassava. Uh, I want to assure you that tapioca is safe to eat, <laughs> um, that the cyanide, that generally they use low cyanogen varieties to make tapioca, but also it's been well processed to remove the cyanogens. So why do people eat cassava? Well, really it comes down to food security. And there's an old paper actually that was published and it was actually a law passed in Uganda when the British were uh, uh, in control, in a sense, of Uganda that required every farmer in Uganda to plant uh, cassava in their fields as a food security crop. 
and it's for the reasons that are indicated here. But most importantly is the fact that you don't need a storage facility. And you don't have to worry so much about insects eating your uh, soil bank cassava because uh, in the peel of cassava are, are toxic levels of cyanogenic glycosides. The peel, which is about five millimeters thick, is very high in cyanogenic glycosides. And so there are very few, few things that eat it. Animals don't eat them. Uh, there are a few insects that are a problem, but you can leave it in the soil generally for a long period of time. Um, but very importantly is actually this issue here, theft. Um, this was a surprise to us that had worked in the cassava field. So in early, let's say late 1990s, early 2000, the Rockefeller Foundation did a survey of cassava utilization across Africa called the COSCA study. And one of the outcomes of the COSCA study was the recognition that uh, farmers were planting the most toxic varieties of cassava in many parts of Africa. And the reason they were uh, planting the most toxic varieties was to avoid theft. So again, it provides food security for the local farmer. So what happens when people are starving or if there's a political disruption is that migrating populations would move through the cassava fields. They'd dig up the cassava, break it open, and then taste it. And if it's bitter, they knew they would have to take multiple days to process it to make it safe to eat. And since they're moving through, they wouldn't take the time and they would just leave it in the field. If it were sweet uh, or low cyanogen uh, varieties, then they would consume it directly. So uh, as a food security issue, sort of bio-warfare in a sense, something we're very familiar with at Los Alamos, by the way. <laughs> um, they uh, they uh, plant the uh, most toxic varieties. And then very importantly is this drought tolerance. And this is a figure that I really like. If you're a cassava person um, and you're always dealing with the maize people because they always think they're number one, right? Um, <laughs> We like to show this figure, <laughs> which shows that the maize uh, yields crash uh, whenever there's a major drought in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, at least for subsistence farmers in particular that don't have access to irrigation. But cassava yields are virtually unimpacted uh, by those drought conditions. So that's, that's a major reason why uh, people are using cassava. So to, to put this team together really was, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, is, was an international effort. And um, when I was uh, directing the program, I started out at Ohio State. Then I moved to the Danforth Center. And now I'm somewhere else. So uh, it's just a migrating program, essentially. But uh, many, we, so the initial part was really the engineering and the transformation to introduce traits uh, to meet these objectives. And most of that work was done by the individuals indicated here. Uh, plus their postdocs and graduate students uh, in that program. We also had a post-harvest physiology group, so that dealt with the shelf life issues. Uh, plant breeding and mapping groups, uh, Martin Forgeni. I want to point out Martin in particular. Martin is a native of Nigeria, and he played uh, several critical roles in, our, in the success of our program. And he is currently the acting director of uh, phase two, and he is now based in Abuja, Nigeria. And this was uh, part of our long-term strategy was to actually have African ownership of the program. So while the initial research was done largely in developed countries, the overall strategy was African ownership so that uh, the likelihood, again, of adoption and acceptance uh, would be high. And so I'll come back to that uh, issue again at the end of the talk. We had a biosafety, regulatory, and intellectual property team. And um, actually, our, our program director at the Gates Foundation initially started uh, in our uh, IP team at the Danforth Center. And uh, IP turned out to be a really big issue for this. If you're genetically engineering a crop, you're, you're using a number of uh, patented technologies. And there are really only two strategies to deal with patents. One is you go to a country where the patent doesn't apply and do the work. And one of our um, colleague, uh, I, I should say, programs in the Grand Challenges actually did that. And that was the banana biofortification team. So they did all their transgenic work in Uganda. 
and nobody patents in Uganda for IP around biotech in general. So, um, so that got around their problem. But we started our project in the US on the GMO technologies. And so we had to have freedom to operate. And the way we dealt with this is we set a benchmark for humanitarian purposes. And the benchmark was that um, we asked corporations and universities that own the IP to provide us their technology free of royalties if the farmer earned no more uh, or earned more or equal to, let me back up. In other words, if, it, if the farmer earned $50,000 or less uh, income, there would be no royalty paid. If it was more than $50,000 per year, then they would have to pay a royalty. Well, in Nigeria and other countries where the annual income is less than $1,000 a year, there are no farmers that would be paying royalties. So um, I have to say, you know, there are a lot of companies that get bad reps about this. But all of the major biotech companies, with the exception of one, whose name starts with an S, I can't I'll say who they are, um, gave us freedom to operate on their technologies. And Monsanto, which is actually across the street from Danforth, not only gave us freedom to operate, and they were the first to do so, they gave, them free this, they gave us freedom to operate on every technology they had in their portfolio. If we needed anything, they gave it to us for free. Um, we only had one other, besides the company that starts with an S issue, and that was an uh, uh, Ivy League university that starts with a D. Okay. And they, uh, they owned a technology uh, for zinc biofortification that we wanted to use. And um, they said, well, we'll, give, we'll let you use it, but you've got to pay all our patent costs. And that's $30,000. And we hadn't built that into the budget. So anyway, the person in charge of the zinc program was butting his head against the wall, was going nowhere. The PI actually had identified this gene was very much in favor of happening. And so he called me up. So I said, I, you know, we can't get this to work. So I called their intellectual property office, and I said, We've got every major corporation and university behind us on humanitarian aid for Africa for biofortification of cassava, except you. I don't think you want to see a press release coming out saying the only reason we couldn't address zinc but malnutrition was because the Dartmouth oh, oh, I said, uh, IP office wouldn't give us freedom to operate. So the next day they gave it to us. <laughs> so anyway, sometimes you have to use a, you know, persuasion. Um, so in addition, we have, very importantly, of course, is field trial assessment. And here again was an important strategic uh, part of the program that in, you know, when we put it forward, we thought this is going to be important, but in the end, it really turned out to be critically important. In fact, we don't think we could be in Africa without this strategy. And the strategy was to do all the field trials initially in the United States. And we did that in Puerto Rico at the University of uh, Puerto Rico in Mayaguez. And uh, it turned out to be critically important for two reasons. First, we, we knew we could do field trials in Puerto Rico. At that time, we couldn't do them in Nigeria. There was no biosafety commission. We could do them in Kenya, but it was very tricky to, to make that happen. So we knew we could do trials in Puerto Rico. Um, but what turned out to be critically important is when we first approached Nigeria to do the first GMO field trial ever in Nigeria, we actually brought the Biosafety Committee, the National Biosafety Committee, to Puerto Rico to walk the fields and to look at the plants in the field and look at the transgenics compared to the wild type. And what they came away with was a realization that these are not monsters. These GMO crops, and they'd heard, of course, from Europe how horrible they were, uh, were just on the surface look the same as the other plants. And that made all the difference in the world in terms of our getting a permit to go into field trials in Nigeria. Um, and so if you're thinking about doing these, uh, doing GMO trials in Africa, I think you, not using Africa in a sense as a guinea pig, but doing the trials first in your home country to demonstrate that you're confident that the technology is safe. Because if you're doing it in your home backyard, 
then you're willing to take the risks associated with that. And so that message turned out to be critical in terms of adoption and acceptance um, in Africa. And then there's the human nutrition part as, uh, as well, which uh, again I'll talk about later. So the major objectives I already mentioned, and these again are summarized here, but the objectives that are in red are ones that I'll spend a little more, more time talking about because these were actually uh, programs that were part of our my particular lab's operation. Okay, so how did we design this strategy? So if you're doing metabolic engineering essentially, uh, you can really sort of divide this up into two, in three different strategies. One is either push uh, or transport, pull, create sinks uh, for your molecule of interest. And the other actually turns out to be critically important as well, and this is very true for vitamin A, and that's storage. How do you stabilize these molecules once you actually make them? So uh, I'm not going to go through all the elements here, but um, I'll touch on those as I go through the various traits. Uh, but down here at the bottom, of course, there are some technologies that don't fit any of these strategies. And that has to do, of course, with uh, viral silencing and, um, and, uh, and a couple of other strategies. So what I'm going to do is lead you through uh, first the biotech approaches that we developed uh, for the various traits. and. And I'm going to go through that. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. So that was just a quick okay. snapshot. Okay. So for the, the, the iron biofortification, we actually took a very novel approach. We, uh, in my group, we work on algae. Uh, it's a big part of our efforts in biofuels. And uh, we had been working on heavy metal resistance in algae for a few years. And along the way, we discovered a new gene called iron assimilatory protein 1, or FA1. And this gene is unlike any iron transporter that had previously ever been described. It's only found in two genera of algae. And it has some very, very important characteristics. First of all, it only moves iron. It will not move other divalent metals. And that's important because if you're in soils with toxic heavy metals and you're increasing the uptake of iron, you're also likely to increase the uptake of cadmium if it's present, or mercury, or potentially lead. And so um, the fact that this transporter does not move iron turned out to be very important. It also turns out it operates very well at high pHs, where most iron transporters are not very effective. And um, if you want to know more about this work, a lot of this was just uh, recently published. And it enhances iron uptake in wild-type plants. So uh, it, it actually supplements the uh, endogenous iron uptake capacity. So here what you see are iron levels. And the zinc is actually in white. And the reason that zinc is here is to point out that this does not enhance zinc uptake uh, relative to the control, which is here. So this is leaves. Uh, and these are the roots. And what we achieved here was close to 38 actually in the end, it was about 38 parts per million in the best transgenic lines, which actually hit our target objective. So I'm not going to say anything more about this. Um, oh, actually, I am, I guess. I forgot there was another slide I threw in. Um, so one of the issues, uh, of course, is, and this will become important in the next uh, subject area where I talk about zinc, is metal homeostasis across the whole plant. So if you're increasing um, the levels of metal in a particular tissue, there are two sort of strategies, as I pointed out earlier. One is to increase source strength, and the other is to increase sink strength. In this strategy, we actually increase source, source strength uh, by upregulating an iron transporter and overexpressing it in roots. 
And so uh, we wanted to look to see what was happening in the rest of the plant. So again, it's very important, and this will become evident when I talk about zinc, that the leaf iron levels were the same as in wild type. So we did look at the expression of various genes involved in mobilizing iron in the plant in different tissues. And what we did see is that there was a response in the transgenic plants in all tissues with respect to the relative expression of genes involved in metal uptake, metal transport, and actually metal sequestration. So this is ferritin. This is an iron transporter. This is an iron chelate transporter. These are, this is iron reductase, and this is another ferritin. And so you can see that these, uh, uh, and these are all relative to control values. So the color indicates the relative level of expression. But clearly, we're getting altered expression across the plant uh, to reflect this change in metal allocation to different organs. Now, here's the, here's the case where my colleague Dan Schachman at Dan uh, for Center did a different approach. He enhanced the sink strength rather than the source strength. And by increasing the sink strength, specifically in the root, using two different genes and both in combination, so one is ZIP and the other is ZAP, and ZIP is a zinc transporter that's found in the uh, plasma membrane, and ZAP is the transporter that's found in the tonoplast membrane. And so that would sequester the zinc uh, in the uh, uh, vacuole as shown here. So he actually hit the target objective uh, relative to wild type. So he was able to biofortify uh, the zinc uh, in those roots, but the plants looked lousy. So here's the field trial. These are the transgenic plants growing beside wild-type plants. And here you can see a wild-type plant versus a transgenic plant. What he found out was by enhancing the zinc sink strength in the root, it pulled zinc out of the leaves effectively. So the leaves went zinc deficient and became chlorotic. The plants were stunted. And uh, that was the end of the story. So um, we followed up on that subsequently with some other strategies. We're actually increasing both the sink and the source strength. And the preliminary data suggests that we can actually achieve the data. But at this point, that was at the end of year five, that's where that project stood. So that was a project that achieved the target for the, the storage tissue, but no one would adopt it, of course, because the yield is substantially reduced. So uh, Ed Cahoon's group at the University of Nebraska uh, was uh, in charge of both vitamin A and uh, vitamin uh, E biofortification. And it turns out, of course, these are both products of the isoprenoid biosynthetic pathway and share a common intermediate here, which is geronyl geronyl pyrophosphate. And um, so if we go in this direction, you can dedicate geronyl geronyl pyrophosphate to pro-vitamin A biofortification by overexpressing phytoene synthase. And of course, this is a strategy that was used by the Golden Rice program to create golden rice. So we followed up with that strategy. But in addition, uh, one trick that Ed did was he overexpressed DXS to also increase the source strength. So we have a pull in this direction and a push from this direction. And the reason he wanted to do that was that he wanted to also increase the levels of vitamin E, or tocotrienols and tocopherols. And so here, we have a common intermediate that would be going in two different directions. And so by increasing, potentially, the pool size of geronyl geronyl pyrophosphate, we would have sufficient substrate to go in both directions, as indicated here. So here's golden orange cassava. Um, this is wild-type cassava. Uh, this is a transgenic cassava which is expressing both DXS and phytoene synthase. And you can see the levels are much higher here than if we express phytoene synthase by itself. So push and pull uh, gave us a better result than just pull. And this is the orange uh, in, uh, mutation. This was in a mutation identified uh, by Dr. Li Li at Cornell University. It is a dominant recessive mutation that's involved in, in formation of the storage vesicles in which carotenoids are stored. And so it regulates chromoplast development, this particular mutant. 
And she had shown, if you're familiar with these orange cauliflower that are now available in the grocery store, this is the orange mutation, OR uh, prime, which is a dominant recessive uh, mutant. And uh, all, all that's happening in that cauliflower is providing a, a sink where you can accumulate beta carotene. There's no increase in synthesis or turnover rates. There's only a, a place to sequester it. And by doing so, by creating that compartment, they get this nice orange colored cauliflower. Well, it didn't work quite as well uh, by itself uh, in cassava, although there was a bump up uh, in carotenoid levels. But uh, the push-pull strategy actually gave us the greatest result. He actually exceeded the target. Uh, value. We got up to a, this number is now old, it's 40-fold, and it's all trans, which is important because that's the most bioactive form uh, of beta carotene. So this objective uh, was, was really uh, reached very soon and, and very successfully. Now what I'm going to talk about here is the role of cyanide in cassava metabolism. It turns out cyanide impacts three of the trait, target traits that we were uh, shooting for. It impacts the protein levels in the roots. It impacts the cyanide toxicity, of course. And it turns out it also plays a major role in the very rapid post-harvest deterioration of cassava roots. And this beautiful picture that you see here really drives home the role of cassava in the livelihoods of cassava farmers. Here you see in all of these elements, these uh, pictures here, women, and it's very important to note the men are standing in the background here watching, because that's the way it really works. <laughs> the women are doing all the work here. Uh, what they're doing is detoxifying cassava. They're pounding it, they're smashing it, they're cooking it, they're washing it, they're uh, fermenting it in some cases to re essentially remove the cyanogens and make a safe food pro product. And I'll show you the chemistry, the biochemistry of this in a moment. Okay, so here you are. The synthesis of cyanogenic glycosides um, is a pathway that was uh, resolved by Bearder Moeller uh, and colleagues. And it starts with the amino acid valine. And then there are two very similar cytochrome P450s that form the oxime of the amino group on the valine. And then there's further oxidation by a second uh, cytochrome P450 to form the cyanohydrin. And then sugar is added to that, so it's glycosylated. And that's the cyanogenic glycoside that's found in cassava called linamarin. Now, linamarin is stored in the vacuole. And this is work that we did uh, many years ago to show that it's actually sequestered in vacuoles. And there are enzymes in the cell wall called linamarase, which is a deglycosylase, a beta-glucosidase. And that clips off the glucose to regenerate this intermediate here, acetone cyanohydrin. Now this is a very interesting molecule because it can spontaneously decompose to produce acetone and cyanohydrin, but at temperatures above 35 C or pH is above five and a half. It can also be enzymatically degraded by an enzyme called hydroxynitrolase, which is found in cassava, and I'll give you the punchline here, but only in leaves. It's not present in roots. Okay, and that'll become critically important a little bit later. All right, so a few years ago, actually back in 2003, so that's the first paper we published on this, where we turned off this pathway, we found out that this linamarin is only made in leaves. It's not made in the roots, and that was a big deal. Um, because it started to tell us the critical role that linamarin plays in nitrogen metabolism in cassava plants. So it's only made in leaves. It's actually transported down to the roots. And in the roots, it has two fates. It can be stored in the vacuole, or it's deglycosylated in the cyanide, which is slowly re released. Okay, so this is from the, presumably the vacuole or uh, in the cytoplasm is reassimilated to produce amino acids. And these amino acids are critical nitrogen donors, of course, for the other amino acid biosynthetic pathways. So it turns out that the majority of nitrogen that's used to make proteins and roots is actually derived from the cyanogenic glycoside. And if you turn off this pathway, the plants die. 
So the only way, and we didn't know that at the time, when we made transgenic plants where we turned off the pathway by essentially turning off these genes, the only way we were able to rescue those plants is we grew them on MS media that had ammonia in it. And so in the presence of ammonia, the roots would grow. But if we switched the ammonia out of the media and replaced it with nitrate, they died. So this nitrogen is the source of reduced nitrogen for making protein. And that becomes critically important. Now, what's the other biochemical evidence that suggests that's the case? Well, there's an enzyme called rhodonese. And what rhodonese does is condenses methionine uh, with excuse me, cysteine with cyanide to form thiocyanates. It's found in humans. That's how we detoxify cyanide. It's also found in the leaves of cassava, but it's not expressed in the roots. There's also the cyanide assimilatory pathway that makes these amino acids. The activity of these enzymes is actually three times higher in the root than it is in the leaf. And so that gives us further confidence that this pathway is operational. Uh, in the, the cassava root is a cyanide assimilatory pathway. So here we're focusing on this issue of cyanide detoxification. As I mentioned earlier, this enzyme is not expressed in the leaf. And so what happens when you poorly process cassava is you have residual linamarin because it's not well mixed with this enzyme that decarboxylates it. You have residual acetone cyanohydrin, it turns out, and that was a big surprise. And it was a paper that came out in around 2000 by a group of Swedish physicians who surveyed the cyanogens in cassava foods, where they first discovered that acetone cyanohydrin in many foods that was poorly processed was the source of all the toxicity in cassava. And those of us in the field thought there's no way you'd find acetone cyanohydrin because it's unstable. It'll spontaneously decompose. And that turned out not to be the case. So that suggested a strategy, of course. So as I pointed out earlier, this enzyme is not expressed in the root. So the strategy was to overexpress hydroxynitrolase in the cassava root to accelerate the detoxification of the cassava. So if I go back again, the detoxification, you're actually converting linamarin and acetone cyanohydrin into cyanide. Cyanide is a gas. And so if you do this biochemical conversion to completion, you actually detoxify the cassava. The cyanide goes off into the atmosphere. There are issues with that, of course. But it's no longer in the food. All right, so that's what's happening during the processing. So we thought we could accelerate the processing and make it more efficient by overexpressing hydroxynitrolase in the cassava root. So I mentioned there's no activity. There's a tiny bit of activity compared to roots. But we were able to get a 12-fold increase relative to the root expression levels. And this was confirmed by RT-PCR as, as well. So these are the roots of transgenic plants. These are the leaves of the same transgenic plants. And you see the units here are huge compared to here. So this is 1,000 roughly, and that's 3,000. So that gives you some idea of the magnitude of difference there. But then, we did, then what we did was we processed the cassava. So we ground it up. We did this at pH 5.5, so there would be no spontaneous decomposition of acetone cyanohydrin. And then we measured it over time. And here's wild type, and you see it's goes up very rapidly and continues to climb. But in the H&L overexpressing lines, it drops down to essentially zero and a half, about an hour. So usually it takes three days at least to process a cassava. We've got it down to 90 minutes. So that indicates that we're able to re make a safer food product. But very importantly was this other observation. And that is the linamarin content of the roots before it's processed, the intact root. It dropped by 60%. And that takes us back to this story here. So by overexpressing a protein in the cassava root, which would accelerate the, the detoxification of cyanide, we actually reduced the pool size of stored linamarin by 60%. And the reason that we're doing that is because we're redirecting it by creating a strong sink strength here for additional protein in the root. Okay, now 
The other part of the story is, did we actually biofortify cassava for protein? And the answer was yes. And here we hit our target objective as well. It also had an impact on overall total protein in leaves. And that was not expected again. So let's go back to this thing. If we're redirecting cyanide towards amino acid biosynthesis in the roots and creating a larger pool of free amino acids, which turned out to be the case, I'm not showing you the data, but the, the total amount of amino acids actually increased. Then there's the potential for some of that to go back up to the leaf, of course, which is the sink for protein synthesis. There's a lot of protein here, virtually none here. So we, the hypothesis, although it's not actually been proven, is the reason that protein levels are going up in the leaf is we're creating a greater pool of uh, amino acids, and this is the sink for those amino acids, and hence they'll have more protein. So we actually achieved three objectives with one gene. We reduced the cyanide levels by 60%. We accelerated the processing from three days to an hour and a half, and um, we also increased the protein levels. Now, very importantly, this particular protein is 50% essential amino acids. So it's a very nutritious protein. It's also non-allergenic. People eat this protein in their diet who eat cassava leaves. And so it's known to be safe for human consumption. We did a bioinformatic analysis of its potential allergenicity, and there's no predicted allergenicity. So we also were able to address the regulatory issues concerning uh, allergenic proteins. Now, the other part of the cyanide story actually ties into shelf life. Okay. Um, there were two hypotheses that we were addressing to increase the shelf life, and that is to reduce the production of reactive oxygen species after the plant is harvested, and the other was to quench any reactive oxygen species that was actually generated during the harvesting process. And so the reason that we're focusing on reactive oxygen species was that our colleague John Beeching at the University of Bath had many years ago uh, had shown that one of the earliest biochemical signatures of the rapid post-harvest deterioration was a big burst of reactive oxygen species generation. And then there's some downstream events, and some of the late events are associated with bacterial and fungal infections that make this totally unpalatable to eat. Bottom line is these roots rot within two days after you harvest them, and that has a lot of implications. It means you can't transport it long distances to cities. It means you can't market it to your friends in Nairobi. It means that the amount of uh, cassava you can harvest on a day is the amount you can process on that same day or within a day or two. And so that limits the size that a family can actually harvest and process. That is a security issue because you can't predict what's going to happen downstream. So if you can actually harvest at the optimal time, you have greater food security. So it has implications both in terms of income generation and food security. All right. So as I pointed out, reactive oxygen species is central to this role, the early event in post-harvest deterioration. And so we predicted, made the hypothesis, that if we could, in, and we knew that cyanide inhibits, inhibits, of course, mitochondrial respiration by blocking cytochrome uh, uh, C oxidase, or complex 4, that uh, if we could alleviate that uh, process, then we could uh, reduce the ROS production and perhaps prevent uh, rapid post-harvest deterioration. So to test this hypothesis, we went back to the transgenic plants that we made back in 2003, in which we substantially reduced the synthesis of cyanogenic glycosides in leaves. And it turned out that when we do that, we get a 99% reduction in the pool size of cyanogens in the roots, but they can't survive. It's a great idea, but you, kill, you throw the baby out with the bathwater, essentially. So anyway, we took this dye, H2DCFDA, and don't ask me what it stands for, <laughs> um, and we incubated this with the root tissues, and these are the plants that have virtually no cyanogenic glycoside, very little ROS production. Here's wild type, lots and lots of ROS production. 
Here we took the transgenic with no cyanogen storage and we complemented it biochemically with the amount of cyanogen that should be there. It all came back. And so that strongly suggested that the source of reactive oxygen species was, mitochond was the inhibition of complex four by cyanide, as shown here. Now, plants are really cool. We all know that. That's why we're in this room. And one of the things that they do that's really cool is they have an escape valve. So if this complex four is inhibited for any reason, and that can happen under anaerobiosis, for example, or low oxygen tensions, there is another direction for the electrons to go rather than generating reactive oxygen species when all of these electron transfer complexes are over-reduced. And that's the alternative oxidase. And alternative oxidase is cyanide insensitive. That turns out to be critically important. So we predicted if we overexpressed AOX in the roots of cassava that we would generate less reactive oxygen species because we have an escape valve for those electrons. And that turns out to be the case. So does it work? And the answer is yes. And that works really well. So here's wild type, and this is something that you would find completely unpalatable. It looks horrible, as you can see here. This is a series of transgenics, and of course you get altering levels of expression in your uh, transgenics. But here is a high expressor. And this is after 21 days. This is three weeks. This is a very good looking cassava. This is one I would eat. I wouldn't eat this one, and I wouldn't eat that one, nor would anyone else. So um, we actually hit our target objective by reducing the production of reactive oxygen species. But serendipitously, we actually achieve the same objective by another strategy. And that goes way back to the beginning, and that's beta carotene. Those beta carotene accumulating plants actually also have long shelf life, out to three weeks. And it's for a very similar reason. Beta carotene is a known quencher of reactive oxygen species. And so by elevating the beta carotene, we actually achieve the same objective. So we have two ways of actually getting there. And uh, both work very successfully. So the last story that I'm going to tell you about is the viral disease resistance. And um, uh, that turns out to have worked out fairly well as also. There are two technologies that we ended up using. One is um, a protein uh, that's shown here which is actually a single-stranded DNA binding protein, which had been isolated from a phage. It turns out this protein will interfere with the replication of viruses. And so overexpression of the single-stranded um, DNA pro binding protein provided resistance, but also the RNAi strategies, which in the end turned out to be the better way to go. It turned out that by expressing single-stranded DNA binding proteins, we actually got a depression in cassava yield which is not unexpected. In the end, it turned out to be the case. But the RNAi did not suppress yield. And so the RNAi strategy is actually very, very successful. It's moved through field trials in Uganda and it's, and it's virtually at the state of commercialization or release, essentially, at this point. So at the end of three years, so this project started in 2005. At the end of 2008, we'd actually shown proof of concept for all of our strategies. And I have to say, collectively, for a group doing this, that we were really quite proud of this accomplishment because, in many cases, we didn't even know the biochemistry of these pathways. We didn't know about cyanogens. We had some ideas about shelf life. Um, we tried some controversial approaches, for example, the iron bore biofortification using a gene which had never been used for that purpose. And at the end of three years in greenhouses, every objective had been met with the exception, of course, of the problem with the chlorotic plants and zinc. Um, and so we backed off on that particular trait, although we've come back to that, as I said, in a moment. All right. So we're at the end of three years, and Gates comes to us and says, well, you know, we're happy with your progress. We're going to give you extra money. And we said, oh, thank you. And um, so they doubled our budget the last two years. And what we were able to do in those last two years were very important things. We brought in. Uh, young scientists from Nigeria and from Kenya and from Uganda. And we started to train them in our laboratories to do all the molecular biology. They learned, we gave them a crash course in GMO technology. Two months intensive training and, and uh, 
cassava tissue culture, agrobacterium cloning, E. coli cloning, uh, transformation, characterization of the traits by mass spectroscopy or whatever the case may be. And um, they, at the end, they were, I have to say, they were really well trained. The objective there was to push the project to Africa. So uh, eventually what would happen is these traits are going to be, the genes will be moved to our African colleagues and they'll actually reconstruct the plants there. The other aspect that we were able to do with the supplemental funding was identify farmer preferred cultivars. The cultivar that we started with was not a farmer preferred, it was easy to transform. And so we surveyed across Nigeria, we surveyed across Kenya, we got together 30 experts across those countries and identified the, the most popular cultivars and brought those into our tissue culture regime and regeneration. And Nigel Taylor was really responsible for most of this work at Danforth. And um, I have to say it was very successful. We were able to transform the most popular varieties, both in Nigeria and uh, Kenya. The other aspect was we were able to do a health impact analysis, the so-called ex-ante analysis. And John Fiedler, who's an economist, and uh, uh, George Norton, who's at Virginia Tech, were involved in that, as well as Mark Maneri, who's a pediatrician. They went on the field. They surveyed villages in our target areas uh, to find out what foods are being consumed, what fraction of the diet, how much did they cost, what percentage of the diet was cassava, what was the nutritional status of children under the age of five? So they took blood samples from kids. They did diet profiles of those kids. And then they took this information and they calculated the number of disability adjusted life years that would be saved um, by the intervention strategy. And these numbers are shown here for a number of target countries and they're big. So if you can, and this is a very conservative assessment of a 30% adoption rate and only 10% of the nutrients actually being taken up from the biofortified cassava. So the impact is huge. Saving a million disability adjusted life years per year across these countries is a big deal. And I don't think it, you can argue about that. We also had to calculate the cost, because biotechnology, as you can imagine, and the regulatory approval has a cost associated with it. And so there's a metric that's used by people in the economics area in terms of uh, foods and biofortification. And that metric is, what is the cost per dally saved? And it turned out, for our strategy, the calculation, including deregulation, and nutritional trials would be $43 per year saved. And I think most of us in this audience would gladly give $43 to live a year longer. But there's a metric, and, the, and we were talking about this last night with uh, the graduate students. The metric is, uh, and I don't know how they came up with this, so it's not my metric, but the metric is if the cost per dally saved is greater than the annual income in that country, then it's not an economically viable intervention. Well, the annual income in Nigeria is on the order of about six to $800 a year. So we're well below that metric. All right. Then the other issue we had to calculate was, is, given this value, what's the benefit to cost ratio? And that number was huge, 23. So clearly, biofortification using transgenic approaches is not only economically a viable approach, but the benefit to cost ratio is very high. And so then we compared that to the other intervention strategies. And the other intervention strategies are vitamin supplementation, and in other words, distribution of vitamins to villages, or biofortification of food post-harvest which requires an industrial capability, of course. And when we did ran those numbers, the GMO, or genetic approach, is probably the better way to put it, a biofortification, was half the cost of those other intervention strategies. So it also uh, beat that metric. So this clearly was the most cost effective, and also, in a sense, the most easy to, to initiate. Because if it's adopted and accepted, it's a one-time event. And um, you don't have to come back day after day with supplements. You don't have to come back day after day uh, 
of post-processed biofortified foods. So the challenge then was could we get into Africa and uh, to do the GMO trials. And one of the items that we were most proud of was we were the first GMO field trial approved in Nigeria. And to do that, as I mentioned earlier, we brought the Biosafety Committee to Puerto Rico. But we also had to strictly follow the Cartagena protocols for GMO field trials, which meant that the entire field site was surrounded by a fence that was buried a meter into the soil with the guardhouse. And, and that's a nice guardhouse, too, by the way. So we paid for all of this through our program, built the guardhouse, put a guard on site. We didn't advertise where the site is. And then the plants, after they're harvested, the field has to sit a year and fallow to make sure no subsequent plants come up. All flowers, if they do occur, had to be removed. And the GMO plants, when they were done processing, had to be burned in a pit and buried. And so we did all of that. And uh, we were the first to get a federal approval for uh, a GMO field trial in Nigeria. And as you can see, that was in November of 2008. So where we stand at the end of, where we stand really right now is that we've achieved these first series of objectives that are shown here. And we're, right now we're right around in this area here. Um, and um, ideally we should be a little further along. But we did run into some problems along the way. And one of the problems we ran into was actually tracking plants, which is a logistics problem. And it's not a problem that we actually had ever anticipated. But we do a lot of handoffs along the way, where material is generated in one lab. It goes to get multiplied by another group of people. It gets shipped across the sea, and then it gets repotted, and then blah, blah, blah. And it gets planted. And then people are supposed to keep track of all of this to make sure we don't confuse plants. And it's turned into a huge problem. Um, and so we've instigated uh, barcode tracking uh, systems. We're now going actually to gene genotyping. It's gotten to the point where we have to do that to actually follow these plants and make sure that the transgenic is the transgenic and the wild type is the wild type. That has probably been our biggest problem uh, in the whole program, which is surprising because you'd think it wouldn't be such a big problem, but it really is. So where are we with phase two? So with phase two, we're now stacking these three traits into a single farmer preferred cultivar that's virus resistance. Uh, there are trials in Nigeria and Kenya. There are nutritional assessments, product development, and regulatory approval. And so that's what's underway right now for the next uh, two to three years. Uh, finally, I want to thank the people, particularly in my group, who, uh, who did all the great work here. Um, Dr. Uzo Himeri was involved in the iron biofortification work, and that was really his domain. This is uh, uh, one of the trainees uh, who came into the lab by the name of Kaya. Kaya is an amazing molecular biologist, and he's at the uh, National Rukops Research Institute in Umadiki, uh, Nigeria, and an intellect, really a very this guy is going somewhere. If you ever get a chance to work with this guy in Nigeria, he is a go-to guy. Um, I can really recommend. Solomon is uh, also from Nigeria, another trainee. He uh, came into the program, but he's now moved into a different direction. Uh, Elisa Lieva Guerrara is, uh, uh, worked on the um, cyanide metabolism and the protein expression in cassava roots. That was her work. This is Tawanda Zidenga, who's still with me as a postdoc now. He's from um, Zimbabwe, and he did the extended root shelf life by overexpressing alternative oxidase. Narayana Narayanan, another postdoc, uh, worked on the iron biofortification, the hydroxynitrile lyase project, and uh, the cyanide metabolism. He was capable of doing a lot of different things all at one time. This is Paul, another trainee. And uh, Paul is still in the program, in the training program. He uh, remains at Danforth Center at the present time. And then uh, Shanta Pires, who is our administrative director uh, at the Danforth Center. So, so that's the group. And thank you for your attention.